Hello and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to hashtag what the patriarchy where we are working to completely destroy the patriarchy from its roots. Inshallah. Thank you so much for being here with me. This is Shahnaz. I'm so sorry that I've been away for so long for I think two, three months now. Um, I've got so many commitments and also a lack of energy to produce more of these videos. If you want to help me out, please contact me and we can talk about how you can help me with these videos. Um, partly, by the way, because the patriarchy is so exhausting to fight and a lot of you know that struggle, but we have to do, we have to do this. We got to fight the patriarchy because it needs to die yesterday. But I would also like to give credit to the folks who gave me the energy and the inspiration to create this episode and the two more episodes that are coming up, inshallah, soon. Um, and also to just get me back on track with these, with these episodes. Uh, folks who have been emailing me the last few months asking wonderful questions, sharing their struggles with me, um, sharing great insights into all things Islam. Thank you so much for writing to me. This also includes, by the way, academics who reached out to me, all women and non-binary folks. It is absolutely crucial that I add here. Um, after the whole fiasco on an academic Islam listserv where some mansplainers tried to criticize my videos without even watching them, they admitted to not watching them. Um, after some wonderful, wonderful male allies of mine shared links to these videos with them um, on this listserv and uh, it was really embarrassing for them, not for me. Um, the patriarchy and its guts, I, I, I tell you. So in this episode, we will discuss how the patriarchy creates, constructs, imagines, portrays, literally invents God in the image of an abusive man. That's not God, that's misogyny. That's a form of patriarchy. I wanna highlight here also the importance of having complicated relationships with God and reflections on those relationships, those complicated relationships as an act of jihad. One sec, I gotta drink my tea. So here's the thing, in the last few days, just in the last, I think three, four days, or maybe the last week, I have received several emails from Muslim women who are hurting, who are struggling with their faith, and when they look for resources to help guide them, to bring them back to Islam, essentially, they see the face of patriarchy, of the, the, the face of patriarchy only. Um, and this patriarchy yells at them. It makes them feel terrible. It attacks them. It dismisses them. It invalidates their emotions, their feelings, their experiences. And then they accidentally or randomly come across something on Islamic feminism. Um, and they tell me about the impact of this discovery, of this new discovery on their faith, on their world, on their relationships with Allah, with Islam. And I'm not the only Muslim feminist blogger or vlogger who gets such emails. If you ask any other Muslim feminist blogger about what kinds of emails they receive from readers, you'll see the exact same pattern. And what I'm realizing slowly is that they always say that Islamic feminism saved them. I think I was having this conversation with some Muslim academics recently. They always say that Islamic feminism saved them, that it saved them theologically, spiritually, personally, and so on. It saved their relationship with Allah, with Islam. It brought them back to Islam. So Islamic feminism is bringing people, women, um, back to Islam. And that is also my story. And I know that that is a story of many of you watching this. And yet I have never met anyone, anyone here, meaning women, my intended audience for this vlog, saying that patriarchal or mainstream Islam saved them. Okay, that's important. That never happens. In fact, that again, that actually hurts them. Many people leave Islam as a result of the mainstream Islam that is all around us, that many of us grow up with. The Islam that's sexist and bigoted and homophobic and misogynistic and an Islam that lacks compassion. And I know that not all Muslims grow up with this kind of Islam, but many of us do, and this is about them. And when I say here that Islamic feminism is saving these people, Islamic feminism becomes a fluid term. It is a very fluid term. It doesn't have to be one specific interpretation of, God, of Islam. 
Um, it's basically an Islam that's not sexist, that is not violent, that is whether it's emotionally, spiritually, physically, and so on. It's compassionate, it's egalitarian, it's welcoming, it's validating, um, and it's accepting of people's journey. It's a kind of Islam that recognizes and values that people are on a journey, that Muslims are on a journey, that people of faith are on a journey, and that this journey is not the same for everyone for obvious reasons, partly at least because of how different our experiences, um, our experiences are both, both on this journey and generally also as citizens of the world and as gendered human beings. We may not even have the same destination. We may not have a specific same destination, but I think that generally that destination is God for the people that I'm hearing from um, and for many people who have a religion. I can't tell you how many emails I've also received from Muslim women telling me that they are or on the verge or were on the verge of leaving Islam, and again until they discover Islamic feminism, um, or and then when they discover that Islamic feminism is an option, that alternatives to their to their current realities and their current ideas of Islam exist, that their whole again their whole world changes, um, that the God that they were taught about is not the God of the Quran. Um, or of Islam that the only, or, or really the only kinds of God that they have to believe in, that this God is compassionate, that God can be compassionate and loving and beautiful, who loves beauty. Um, this God doesn't punish or doesn't have to punish people for the smallest things like showing a strand of your hair. And this is why you see my hair with all of its strands, alhamdulillah. Um, because almost all of my life, except for probably the, the past year or so, I was told that if a man sees any strands of my hair, I kid you not, I will be punished for a man seeing my strands of my, even one strand of my hair. And I'm not gonna traumatize you like the way that I was traumatized with, the specific detailed descriptions of what that punishment is, of how God punishes women when a man looks at their hair, a man who's not related to them. And there are also Muslims who believe that if a man sees your hair or any parts of your body other than your face, some even believe you're on your face too, while a man is fasting, a man who's not related to you is fasting, then his fast breaks and you are responsible for that. You are accountable to God for the fact that his fast broke because he saw a, he saw a strand of your hair or your face or, I don't know, your, some parts of your body. What the hell? What the actual hell, patriarchy? What kind of a God does that to people? This is the Islam that nobody needs. This is the Islam that we don't want, that is objectively, by the way, inaccurate, okay? And this is also where Muslim teachers and preachers of Islam need to be extremely careful because they're abusing their responsibility as teachers of the religion, of Islam, of any religion. You're pushing people away from Islam. You're not bringing them towards God. You need to be bringing them towards God and you're actually pushing them away from God. And that is entirely on you. And you're accountable to that for God. You're accountable for that to God. But here's the thing. This isn't from God. We know that this isn't from God. This is the patriarchy imagining and portraying God in the image of men and very particular kinds of men, abusive men, in fact, right? The angry, the cold, the evil, the sexist, the unforgiving, again, abusive men. Have you ever paused to reflect on what your idea of God is and how similar and, and I, if not identical, this idea of God is to an abusive man? Is this God out to punish you for the smallest sin, for the smallest thing that you do, for the smallest mistake that you make, okay? Um, or at all times, really, just even when you don't make mistakes, you gotta be so afraid of this God because, whoa, this God is gonna send you to hell for, again, the smallest thing that you can do. And, and again, seldom rewards you for, or has any compassion towards you. Um, or does, it, does this God criticize you, you know, for, everything that you do. Do you find yourself begging for this God's mercy and compassion and forgiveness? Again, because you made the smallest mistake possible or even did something that is so harmless and that you weren't even aware of. Because I know Muslims who do that. And I think it's sad. I think it's sad to have that kind of a relationship with God and that kind of a view of God. 
Or is this God more forgiving and merciful and understanding like what the most common phrase in the Quran teaches us, the Basmala, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, right? a compassionate, benevolent God. Somehow, when I think about God, when, when, when I think about the relationship that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has with Allah, I don't see an angry, violent, vicious, evil, vengeful God. I find a loving God who, by the way, even is also very funny and chill. That, I think, is the God of Islam. That is the God of Islam that we should all know about and hear about and learn about and develop a relationship with. But I also want to be careful here. Uh, and, well, as an academic, I'm not supposed to oversimplify things like this. I don't think I'm oversimplifying this, just FYI. And then again, my I'm not imagining academics as my audience here. I'm imagining Muslim women and others who have been marginalized and harmed by mainstream Islam. I imagine them as my, as my audience. Um, either way, I do want to acknowledge the fact that the Quranic idea of God is a little more complicated. It's not simple. It's not a simply, it's not a simple loving God. Um, because just like the Jewish Bible, the New Testament, these other scriptures and other religions, the Quranic God is complicated. And if not for any other reasons, then for this reason, at least we are absolutely allowed to have complicated relationships with Allah. Okay. Because God's persona itself is very complicated. We're not robots. Our experiences with religion have everything to do with how we imagine and understand and relate with God. One sec. Okay, so back to the tragedy of the patriarchal visions of God that we're constantly bombarded with. They make us want to escape ourselves. They make you want to escape yourself and your past and God and, of course, Islam. I seldom come across men talking about Islam and God as compassionate and understanding and validating and essentially practical, right, in, in ways that humans can appreciate and relate with. These men, these male teachers of Islam, they get angry, they shout, they get defensive if you criticize them or if you, if you introduce an alternative to them. They gaslight you, they lie to you, they make up things, they cite only other similarly spiritually violent men to con convince you of their point. And these are all signs of abusive men in, in relationships. In other words, these dudes project onto Allah their own personalities so that God becomes just like them. And just the mere fact that they even dare to imagine God as a man is a problem to begin with. Because th while they insist that God has no gender, when you do try to use she for God, because you're like, well, okay, if God has no gender and we're allowed to use a gendered pronoun like he for God, then can we also at least occasionally use she for God? And they panic when you do this. They accuse you of all kinds of things when you do this. So that is the first sign right there that God, as they portray her, does in fact have a gender and that gender is not woman. And that is why you can't she for God. The point is, if he works for God, why can't other gendered pronouns or non-gendered pronouns work for God as well in English? And the patriarchy does not like that for reasons that I'm going to mention in just a second. So how on earth we have, we as an ummah have allowed for this to continue for so long, I don't know, but I have my guesses. Okay, so now that we've established that the God that these scary ass teachers of Islam portray as God is actually not God, but essentially a scary ass misogynist human, we have man, misogynist, violent man, we have to ask, what is at stake for these preachers of Islam in these kinds of teachings? What do they stand to gain from the current view of God? And what do they lose from an alternative, more kinder, more compassionate, more egalitarian view of God? And the answer, my beloveds, is everything. I mean, can you imagine how much power these men enjoy if they can convince people, their audiences, that their opinions are actually God's laws, they would lose so much if they didn't intimidate and scare us into believing this kind of God.
they would lose the infinite amount of privilege that they enjoy, the male privilege, the male supremacy that they enjoy. These folks thrive on scaring us into submission and not to God again, but into themselves, submission to themselves. And it's like, as Amin Awadud says, patriarchy is shirk. We don't end up doing what God says to do. We end up doing what these men tell us to do. And also a lot of these men wouldn't have jobs if you were to think critically about what they teach you in the name of this cruel, cruel as God that they have invented. But it's also possible that these projections, that these misogynistic projections, these violent projections aren't uh, 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 unto God, are not intentional or deliberate or maybe even, con even conscious. They may very well be subconscious too. You see, I teach a first year course on Abrahamic religions and we read a lot of Jewish and Christian and Muslim scriptures there. Um, they also learn about the Baha'i faith, but not in as much detail as the other three, not the point here. And I always have a couple of Muslim students in these classes, okay? The Muslims too, but mostly the non-Muslims, gen generally speaking, express some surprise about the way that God is portrayed in the Quran. So they're usually surprised that God forgives Eve and Adam when they disobeyed God, or that before the flood of Nuh or really any other destructions, God gives the people plenty of warnings and plenty of chances. And a side note here, I don't want to justify these destructions. I think that when looked at from the perspectives of the innocent people who were destroyed in these events, like animals and plants and women and children, everything changes. But my point here is that these non-Muslim students of mine are coming to the Quran with certain biases, many of which we unpack and discuss throughout the semester, and are therefore, and these students are therefore then surprised when they don't find that kind of God in the Quran that they were expecting to find. They don't grow up with, you know, with Muslim scholars and preachers and teachers of Islam teaching them about God in the Quran or otherwise. And so in their case, it's the Islamophobia around them that's introducing such images of God in their heads. And they're not always conscious of these images. They don't think about them until they come to this class or probably a class similar to this. But some of my Muslim students are absolutely shocked that the image of God, that they grew, the Islamic God that they grew up with is not supported in the Quran either. And this is why I insist that these portrayals of God that so many of us grow up with are literally inventions. They're inventions of the patriarchy. They're made up because they, they help keep the patriarchy going. In these Muslims case, it's, Muslim patriarchy that's responsible for the lies that they internalize. I don't want to give patriarchal Islam a benefit of the doubt here, but I wonder sometimes if some of the good teachers of Islam who have internalized these images of God have ever actually reflected on these images and on the impact of their teachings about God to Muslims who are sincerely searching for God. I'll end with this note. We're all on a journey. You're on a journey, even the misogynist Muslim teachers of Islam that you're constantly reading from and hearing from are on a journey. Recognize this and ask yourself where you want to go and where you are currently. Who do you want to meet along the way? Who do you want to avoid along the way? Why might that be? The compassionate God that you're looking for, that you're searching for is there. But there's also going to be a lot of obstacles on the way to this destination, to God, to along your search for God. And those obstacles, unfortunately, include the patriarchal visions of Islam that you're bombarded with on a daily basis. And as you begin to think about this journey of yours, remember, I said this in the first episode of the, of the channel, this is your jihad. Discovering God, discovering the God of Islam is your jihad. Discovering God, period, is your jihad. And working on your relationship with this God is your jihad. And there's no limit on how long it should take you. There's no specific way also to do this. But there's certainly no limit on how long it should take you to get to that destination. You have your whole life to do that. Be kind to yourself and allow yourself to take that time you really have no reason to rush because if anything happens to you during this journey, then remember what Allah tells us in the Quran. It's as if you died in the path of Allah. 
Oh, and one more thing. If you find this vlog, this channel beneficial, and I'm so glad that you do, I encourage you to read more on Islamic feminism and write to the feminist authors and scholars whose works that whose works I have discussed in this channel so far, if they're alive. So Fatma Mernissi is not alive, unfortunately. Um, or any feminists, Muslim feminists who come across and write to them. Tell them that you benefit from their work. And uh, because I'm primarily just repeating what other scholars have said, what other Muslim, Muslim feminist scholars have found and what they have written. So that's all, my beloveds. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next episode, inshallah. And the next episode is going to be on why it is totally valid and legitimate and okay for Muslims, but especially Muslim women, to have a complicated relationship with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Stay tuned. Salam.